Yes. Yes. The Occupy movement has changed the political terrain. There's a whole new awareness of the power of the 1%, of the systemic inequalities, and the power the 99% must take back. The left and the Communist Party were all in the thick of it across the country. Shortly after Occupy Wall Street jumped off, word went out online and on the moccasin path that Angela was coming to speak. And thousands came out at night to hear her. Why? Because Angela and the movement to free her continues to represent fighting the power. Fighting the power and winning. Angela, our sister Angela. Good afternoon, everyone, sisters, brothers, comrades, friends. First of all, let me say that it is uh, indeed an honor to have been invited to participate in this tribute to Henry Winston on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of his birth. Over the last 25 years or so, I have often thought about Winnie and about how much I miss his brilliant analyses, his warmth, his compassion. I think he had the most genuinely expressive smile of anyone I have ever known. Communists are often accused of giving so much of their love and affection to the revolutionary struggle that they have little time left to devote to one-on-one -on -one relationships. Winnie was certainly the most convincing refutation of that assumption. His love for the struggle was always matched by his love for all of the individuals in his life, both those in his intimate life and those in his political life. I cannot reflect on the life of Henry Winston without also remembering Kendra and Franklin Alexander, who loved Winnie with all their hearts. And it was the two of them along with Charlene Mitchell, who recruited me into the Communist Party. A constant theme of our many discussions back then was the life and work of Henry Winston. And I don't think I would be exaggerating if I said that it was Winnie channeled through Kendra, Franklin, and Charlene who persuaded me to join the Communist Party. When I think back on that period, I find it hard to believe that so much happened within a relatively short period of time. What stands out most in my memory of the events that unfolded after I became a communist was the presidential campaign during which Charlene Mitchell and Mike Zagarell were the party's candidates for president and vice president. And at the same time, I was working on a Marxist-Leninist political education program for the Black Panther Party. I was a graduate student this, during this time and had uh, been a member of the Communist Party for less than a year when I accepted a position to teach at UCLA. During the summer prior to the semester, I was scheduled to teach Kendra Alexander and I joined a delegation to Cuba. 
And after an amazing time in revolutionary Cuba, we returned to discover that I had been made the target of a raging anti-communist attack headed by Governor Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I mention those details. I mention the details of this period, uh, not only because this was when I first met Henry Winston, but also because he was a constant inspiration to me, especially when it came to garnering the courage to stand up to attacks I never imagined would be directed individually at me. In my own mind, I compared my journey as a black girl from the Deep South to Winnie's migration up from Mississippi to Kansas City. It helped me create the resolve to confront the racism, the sexism, the anti-communism that shaped the attacks that were directed against me. In Strategy for a Black Agenda, Winston wrote a postscript to his pamphlet, The Meaning of San Rafael in which he acknowledged all of those who had played a major role in the struggle for my freedom. He failed, however, to point out that he himself had played a crucial role in the development of, especially in the development of the international campaign. As chair of the Communist Party of the United States of America, he appealed to communist parties throughout the world, from South Africa to Australia to India. In that postscript, he wrote, quote, that the growing strength and prestige of the socialist world made it much more difficult for US imperialism to exploit anti-communism in this case as was done so successfully in the Rosenberg-Smith Act and other political cases of the 1950s. But characteristically, he did not acknowledge that it was his own organizing efforts, his, Charlene's, and many others, which helped to persuade communist parties all over the world to encourage their members to support a young, an unknown, relatively unknown member of the CPUSA. Henry Winston helped to imbue an important internationalism into the black liberation movement of that period. Through his writings and speeches, he helped communist and progressive activists to develop a conceptualization of solidarity with African freedom struggles that was grounded in anti-imperialist unity. At a time when W.E.B. Du Bois's work had been long marginalized, both in academia and in popular circles, Winnie introduced Du Bois to young activists and scholar activists. Winston's role in the creation of NAMESOL, the National Anti-Imperialist Movement in Solidarity with African Liberation, helped to further popularize Du Bois's notion of an anti-imperialist pan-Africanism, which emphasized unity with socialist countries against settler colonialism and against the neo-colonialist strategies that attempted to bring quote, free African countries into the orbit of capitalism. Inspired by Henry Winston, Namesol generated support against the apartheid regime in South Africa that foreshadowed the important US role in the global anti-apartheid movement in the 1980s that eventually brought down the racist government and helped to usher in a new era of democracy in South Africa. Through Namesol, support was generated in black communities and the labor movement, on campuses, not only for the African National Congress, but for SWAPO, the MPLA, for LIMO, and other progressive African liberation organizations. In 1973, I was 
able to bring greetings from Henry Winston and indeed from the entire party when I visited Congo Brazzaville, Guinea, and Tanzania. The highlight of my trip to Africa was a meeting with Augustino Nato uh, at the MPLA headquarters in Tanzania. I remember that he very specifically asked me to convey his regards to Winnie. Henry Winston was indeed revered throughout the world. Communists and those who were not deterred by anti-communism had no problems openly declaring their admiration for him. In my many travels in the socialist, capitalist, and non-aligned countries, I had the opportunity to hear vast numbers of people express their profound respect for Winnie. But also, on many occasions, I encountered actors, musicians, public figures whose careers might have been placed in jeopardy had they openly declared their admiration for a communist. Uh, uh, these, the, these public figures secretly assured me that Winnie was a major source of inspiration in their own lives. Comrade Jarvis Tyna has described in very moving terms a meeting that took place between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Henry Winston on the occasion of Freedom Way's centennial celebration of W.E.B. Du Bois. It was an auspicious meeting occurring just two months before Dr. King was assassinated. And during the period when Dr. King was deeply involved in the first stages of organizing the Poor People's Campaign. If Dr. King was at all familiar with Henry Winston's writings, he would have known that Winnie always emphasized the inextricable connections between racial oppression, capitalist exploitation, and imperialist war. King's insistence during that period on our understanding the dangers associated with what he called the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism brought him closer to Henry Winston and other communists who always contended that these three modes of oppression created a field on which each helped to sustain and reproduce the other. In November of last year, I had the opportunity to participate in a major Occupy mobilization in Oakland, in Oakland, California. Um, and it was um, the general strike opposing the police violence with which the Occupy encampment was attacked. This march was multiracial, multiracial, multigenerational, multigender, and it emphasized the centrality of working class struggles. As many as 40,000 people participated in that march, and it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful moment to um, experience. The sense that we constituted a powerful community of resistance was palpable. And many people of my generation felt that finally there was some possibility of fulfilling the promise of the struggles of the 60s. As a matter of fact, many people uh, uh, I saw on that day uh, uh, said, it's happening, finally, it's happening. <laughs> you would have thought on that day that the revolution was really happening. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still have a long, a long way to go. <laughs> but what 
has been most important about the upsurge in activism over the last period, including in Wisconsin, Cairo, New York. And the reason I evoke these developments in my tribute to Henry Winston is that for the first time since the 1930s, the era of Winnie's own youthful activism, we can speak openly and honestly about the perils of capitalism. This fulfills a great legacy we associate with Henry Winston's enduring opposition to capitalism and to the raci racism and militarism that has always sustained human history's most rapacious form of economic production. Three years ago, when we enjoyed the planetary euphoria occasion by the election of Barack Obama. I remember thinking that this was a moment I wished Winnie, as well as Kendra, Franklin, and all of those who had given their lives over to the cause of social justice could experience. And while the euphoria has subsided, and some people allow their often valid criticisms to render themselves oblivious to what these last three years might have been like had the Republican candidate been elected. <laughs> there can be no doubt that the current upsurge in labor and social justice activism is directly related to the political climate produced by the election of Obama. And so as we work in multiple arenas with the aim of further expanding the possibilities of socialism, the spirit of Henry Winston will always be with us. Our words and our actions can help to create a future that reflects Winnie's enduring commitment, his incisive vision, and his beautiful smile. Thank you.